Welcome back to our live panel discussion. Directly, we are in three different places, Hong Kong, Paris, and also New York. Thank you very much for joining us for the second panel of the afternoon. So let me talk about the theme. The theme will be, after COVID, what recovery to expect to the world economy? A very important and actually actual question. I will now give the floor to the moderator for this session, the global head of CIB research at Natexis, Jean-François Robin, the floor is yours. Thank you very much. Hi, everyone. So uh, today we will be free in this uh, panel to, uh, to try to discuss the, uh, uh, the world economy. In a sense, I will be joined by uh, Alicia Garcia Herrero. Alicia is probably one of the uh, finest specialists of uh, Asia in general, in China in particular. She's uh, working with the Bogel Institute. She's, uh, she's clearly... Uh, uh, one of the greatest experts on China. So we are quite lucky to have uh, Alicia uh, direct live from, from Hong Kong. And we will be joined as well by uh, uh, Troy Lutka. Troy Lutka is our uh, US economist. Uh, uh, our, pro, our, our, our former chief economist has been uh, named a chief economist within the White House. So now we have Troy Lutka as a very uh, young and talented replacement uh, to discuss the US economy. First thing first, maybe to discuss what could be the shape of the recovery before uh, uh, having some questions around China and the US, clearly uh, uh, center stage into uh, what comes next, um, US election, but as well probably uh, a little bit in the longer run, we have to look at these two uh, superpowers and their interactions. So first thing first, maybe looking at uh, what could be the shape of the recovery. Now we are more and more talking about a square root recovery in a sense, or a bird wing recovery, if you prefer, uh, in a sense that we have a phenomenal, extraordinary shock during the second quarter for most developing economies, first quarter for China, uh, followed by the uh, steep recovery, uh, stronger than expected in a way. But where does it leave us today? probably into something much, much, much slower. And we see that the economies are slowing down after this uh, mechanical recovery, rebound, after the reopening of all, uh, all, all the economy. Uh, and that is probably the, the, the name of the game uh, going forward. Uh, as long as there is no vaccine to this COVID-19, do not expect any normalization of the world economy without a vaccine. So without a vaccine, probably we see this in and out uh, towards uh, some uh, 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 lockdown measures here and there. And the economies are running probably close between 80, 90, 95 of normal, but it won't be above that without a vaccine. And talking a vaccine is very difficult to, to see where we are going. 
most likely, it, this is our central scenario, that probably somewhere down the road, somewhere mid next year, we shall see a vaccine and a, a campaign starting. But do not expect that to be over at the end of 2021. Huh? If you take, for instance, COVAX, huh, the global initiative to, uh, uh, to, to have a, a, a comprehensive vaccination for the, for, for the population in need, uh, they are talking about 2 billion doses of vaccine. And usually now we're thinking that we are going to need two doses of the vaccine. So it means that only 1 billion of people at the end of 2021 will be uh, having this uh, vaccine, if any, uh, of COVID-19. And we are, remember, 7.8 billion in the planet, uh, on the planet. So clearly, we are not to get, not everyone will get the vaccine. And the, the British think tank this week said uh, only 50% of the UK population is going to be, uh, uh, to have a, a vaccine. Probably all the young people below 18 won't get a vaccine. So it will be going to take time to, to, get this, uh, to, to get this vaccine in any way. Uh, probably not before the second part of next year and after that probably uh, some kind of an acceleration as long as there is no mutation of the vaccine uh, but as well think of uh, some some uh, some some uh, some problem problem in the head uh, regarding the vaccine is that we see um, uh, so the efficiency of the vaccine is one, uh, but as well the, the reluctance of uh, some population to, uh, to, to get vaccinated. So if you look at Russia, for instance, 50% uh, of the population uh, is against any uh, idea of vaccine. So uh, Sputnik vaccine is not going to take off anytime soon if you have half of the population not uh, getting the vaccination. And we know that the collective immunization is not before uh, that you have 65-70% uh, of the population immunized. So it's going to take time. And as long as you are going to get a vaccine, probably to be a little bit cynical, people are going to uh, uh, to let the gloves down and to uh, to uh, to, uh, to let the mask down as well. And probably the uh, R, uh, the uh, uh, reproduction rate of the vaccine, is going to reaccelerate again. So think of that as a normalization, uh, a long-term process in our view. So it means that the economies which are rebounding uh, will be normalizing starting normalizing with the vaccine. So probably the precautionary shaving will be put at use. The investment uh, is going to restart when we get the vaccine. Probably the stock market will be rebounding massively uh, before that, probably uh, in this, before December, if we get uh, a first uh, success uh, trial in any vaccine. But clearly investment precautionary saving will be put at use only when we get a clear view of a normalization in, 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 uh, in this regard. So it's why we need all this uh, plan, uh, but uh, both in terms of uh, budgetary policy and monetary policy. And th this is a big difference compared to uh, probably 2008 or previous crisis. And it had the magnitude and the, uh, 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 I would say, uh, uh, um, uh, good uh, cooperation between policy mix, uh, monetary and budgetary, as opposed to 2008, for instance. Huh? Look at what the IMF is saying uh, this, uh, today. Huh? The IMF is saying we need to spend some, some more, not less, in this, uh, in this crisis. And this is exactly what, uh, what's happening at the moment. Huh? If you look at the, uh, the budgetary policy, if you look at uh, the US, huh? uh, it, more than 10% of the US GDP uh, is twice as much as was uh, decided uh, in 2008, is more than what was pledged be, uh, during the, uh, the entrance of uh, US into the Second World War. If you think at the Marshall Plan, uh, the US Marshall Plan, it was a 16, do, uh, 16 billion of dollars, so something like uh, 100, 150 billion of dollars of today, today's dollar. So we are talking about uh, 2.2 trillion in the US, so nothing compared to that. If you look at Europe, same sort of uh, big response. Uh, if you take France, for instance, and 460 billion of, uh, of, uh, of guaranteed guarantees and, and, um, and spending. Uh, if you look at these recovery plans that are coming, and not only at the European level, 750 billion, which is a very uh, stepping stone for a, a more federalist approach from for Europe. But if you take individual states, if you take France, 100 billion of recovery plan. If you take Germany, 130 billion plan. Uh, this is four points of GDP each, and each of it is going to, uh, to have some nice second round effect. So uh, uh, every time you see a 10 point of additional spending by Germany, you come up with probably 1.1, 0.2 of additional GDP for France. And the other way around, if you do some massive investment in 5G, in EVs, electrical vehicles, probably it's going to have some second round effect for automakers, both in Germany and France and so on and so forth. So this is massive effort from budgetary and it's coming. 
it's coming next year, so probably next year will be uh, uh, good in this respect uh, in terms of uh, rebound of economy. Even though you have a stagnation of the four, uh, during the fourth quarter, which is pretty much your scenario now, hein, this, uh, square root recovery, uh, so it's kind of a plateau uh, as of now, uh, but probably mechanically next year we have a growth, if we keep growth as it is in the fourth quarter uh, during all 2020, we have a, a, a growth which will be around 4-5% uh, without any recovery, catching up or spending uh, or investment. So it means that easily next year we will get this kind of numbers that we have in our, in our scenario, which is 7% of rebound in Europe, uh, three and a half something around the US, so clearly a nice rebound, and China uh, well above its potential GDP growth uh, uh, as well. So clearly, uh, next year, the budgetary policy are going to be very, very powerful in this rebound. Monetary policy-wise, we see that uh, all central banks are, are, are making... Uh, are squaring the problem in a way. Huh? The bulk of the, of the shock is, is on government. Uh, we are talking about 65% of the shock of the government uh, uh, into government shoulder during, uh, in Europe, for instance. The bulk of the shock is in government, and central banks are making sure that the financing conditions are, are respected. Uh, no Greek crisis, no Italian crisis, no, I would say, US crisis, despite a, a deficit, a double digit deficit or debt uh, looking uh, very, very similar to what. Uh, Uh, Greek, de Greek debt was looking at uh, 10 years ago. So clearly, some dynamics which should have been quite frightening, which are not, thanks to central banks' strong actions. And central banks are saying two things. We are going to be super accommodative in the future, as at the uh, uh, federal uh, average inflation targeting with the, the, with the Fed, for instance. Bank of England has, has said probably negative rates are on the way if, if, uh, if we're getting to something of a hard Brexit. And the ECB is in the middle of reviewing its monetary policy, but we know already not only it's going to remain accommodative, but probably adding up some object, intermediate objectives, intermediate targets with green transition, with a, a fight against wealth inequality in Europe, and so on and so forth. So central banks are going to remain super accommodative, and they can be doing so because there is no inflation going forward. That was a kind of a debate entering this COVID-19. Are we going to see some rising inflation? This is not the case. So clearly, central banks and, and um, governments can be super active. So once we get this vaccine, probably starting next year, we shall see some kind of a normalization. So this is pretty much a scenario of a strong rebound now after a massive shock. Huh? Never before we have seen such a shock. Huh? Since 1960, uh, only three times in the history we have seen uh, countries with a GDP loss of more than 7%. Almost all countries are, doing, are experiencing that this year. So a, shock, a massive shock followed by a strong rebound, a plateau. Now, this is clearly the scenario of 2020, which is now playing out. Uh, next year shall be not that bad because of this mechanical rebound and central bank and, uh, and massive budget uh, stimulus uh, on the way. Maybe just, uh, and uh, please do not hesitate to, uh, to, uh, to channel some questions. We will take a question at the end. Maybe what I propose is to, uh, to turn to, uh, to Alicia first, uh, ladies first, uh, on question uh, with, uh, with China. So China is 19% of world GDP. It's clearly uh, uh, the country which is now rebounding in a way. And we see that we have positive number, uh, very nice recovery in a way. And China was first into this uh, uh, virus, obviously, and is uh, the first out. So it's a bit of a FIFO story. Uh, so maybe question for you, Alicia, is it a true recovery or is it a recovery led by further imbalances coming from, from China uh, these days? Thank you, Jean-Francois. Thanks for the invitation. It's a pleasure to be here. To the question, it is a recovery and you know that's, that is already great. Imagine that China was actually not recovering, and then it would mean that the rest of the world would be recovering so much more slowly because China is first in and it should be first out. And so it is. But that recovery is shaky. And it is shaky because we're missing the Chinese great consumer. The retail sales are still weak. They're getting better. Disposable income is still not to the levels before the pandemic started. Just imagine for a country whose disposable income was growing over 6%. Just imagine the kind of shock. So that means that that shakiness is going to profoundly affect China's long-term growth negatively. 
And it won't be only China, to be frank, as you know. I mean, the whole point here is 2022, 2023, which we've not yet discussed. And that is also true for China. To end uh, on a positive note, though, let's focus on the short term. At least China is growing. It is growing with imbalances. China is doing as much stimulus as everybody else. Let's not, uh, sorry to say, believe, you know, the somewhat distorted news sometimes that China is doing this just organically, that growth is simple and easy. It isn't. The fiscal deficit is around 18 to 19 percent of GDP, if you measure it properly. So it is doing the same as everybody else, just coming out quicker because it started earlier and because China's potential growth is higher than the rest of the world. That's all. That's the story. But beware of the imbalances, big debt and lower potential growth down the road. Thank you very much, Alicia. And you, you mentioned it in a way you will see that uh, we are in a more and more mercantilist world, less and less cooperative. So in this regard of what we see from China uh, with a, a big, uh, I would say, focus on uh, fixed uh, income, uh, fixed investment, sorry, uh, in, uh, in, in, in uh, I would say exporting his recovery in a way once again. So in this kind of uh, mercantilist, um, we see that China is more and more aggressive and less and less maybe a kind of, a, uh, I was about to say, open, open society, illiberal, we, we, may, we, we may see. Uh, what do you think of that? Is it, is, it, is, it, is it the case for you that uh, China is, is indeed meant to be more and more aggressive and, and is it something we should be a little bit afraid about? Okay, so let me take this question by, uh, in a, uh, I want to introduce a segue to the previous question and get there if you allow me very, very quickly. So because I realized of the audience, this, this, this is an infra uh, event and I perhaps didn't mention, which I think is very important, that the recovery not only is government led, especially fiscal policy, but that fiscal policy is coming directly into the infra space. So about 50% of the fixed asset investment, the growth in fixed asset investment in China is infra-led. That's important because it brings me to your question, believe it or not. I mean, because China's um, old stimulus, 28, was similar, if you ask me. You know, it was an infra-led stimulus, and, uh, and we all were very pleased about it. Why were we? Because China was importing from the rest of the world. Commodities, machinery from Germany, the whole idea was, I will do a stimulus to grow myself, but I will basically create the demand for others. And that will create a China with more soft power and with more economic power with its partners. This time around, it's, it is infra-led, but it's, China is not sharing its growth with the rest of the world. If you look at imports, they are stagnant, if you're lucky, or negative negative growth in many, many of the months that we can see after COVID-19. And believe it or not, with the world that was collapsing, even in the second quarter, I mean, we're talking about the worst moment, Chinese exports were positive, growing positively. So that mercantilism you were referring to has happened this time around because of geopolitical reasons. In other words, China has realized that this time around, it might be not worthy sharing this growth. It might not be worthy because the world is, from China's perspective, closing, or, I mean, closing itself from China. You may, you may see it differently, but the point is they believe, I mean, and they have reasons, frankly speaking, especially from the US, to, be, to feel that threat. And that makes them become more mercantilism mercantilist, and most importantly, rely more on their own demand. So not sharing their growth elsewhere. So it's an infra-led without creating the demand for the rest of the, law, the world. And I want to end with this word because I think it's very important. We're in the run-up to the five-year plan, and we should look for this word there. It's very important. It's dual circulation. This strategy that, that actually Xi Jinping himself mentioned in May as a big theme for China basically means, you know, it's, the, it's like the blood system, you know, like the circulation system. I keep my growth for myself. I, I, I need to become self-reliant. I need to upgrade my industry. If I have any bottleneck, I need to stop it. I need to, you know, improve 
whatever, semiconductors, et cetera, so that I don't depend on the rest of the world. I have a big enough market. That's the first circulation. The second is I may as well export to especially the markets that are still open to me. Those tend to be emerging economies, Belt and Road Initiative, you name it. The West no longer akin to that to this strategy because it's closing down, closing up to me. So that's the story, which I think explains the infrared without imports. That's the difference. Very different from 2008. Very bad news for a world in a major recession. Because China won't be there for us. That's the key message. Thank you, Alicia. Indeed, what uh, what we see is that China is less and less integrated in a uh, uh, in a way in the world trade. In a sense that is more and more vertically integrated. Uh, if you look at uh, China, it's doing all. Uh, almost everything on their own. And we are, Alicia, in this kind of uh, tech war between especially in the US and, uh, and, uh, and, uh, and, uh, and China. Uh, obviously, Europe is a bit of a small player uh, for now in, in this regard. We see that with TikTok, with Huawei. Do you think that China, being more and more inward oriented or vertically integrated, do you think that China, which is a country, a very much aging country. Uh, we, we know that China population is going to be diminished by 25% between now and 2050. So this is going to be a very aging population. And we might look at that a bit like we used to look at uh, Japan at some stage, that Japan was the dominant tech power, superpower of the world in the 80s. And at the end, at the end of the day, do you think that being super innovative is, is possible, being an aging country and not an open society or an open economy, like let's, let's say that, that way? And we have seen that of late, uh, for instance, China is forbidding its, uh, its students to go not only to the US, because that's the other way around is true as well, but as well to Europe. So we see that China is trying to be more and more, again, uh, inward and oriented. And do you think it's possible to be the to winning, winning this tech war uh, in these kind of conditions, Alicia? Great question and very hard to answer. I don't have a crystal ball, but I, I can give you my best guess if you allow me. So imagine we were to cut the world in two. You know, an apple, you cut it in two, half is China, to, to, to make it simple. Uh, China and, and, and basically the countries uh, within China's uh, influence, yeah? Um, can that part of the world, basically, that's your question, by being vertically integrated, still grow, uh, you know, positively and, 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 and uh, do well? That's, that's the question. I think beyond everything you said, which is that, you know, aging make, will make it harder. We, that's why I was talking about structural deceleration of the Chinese economy. It's not me telling you. It's the NDRC, the Chinese uh, plan, uh, Reform and Planning uh, um, uh, um, uh, agency thinking of growth rates below 1.9% in the, in the decade of 2030 to 40. So, you know, they are very aware that, that uh, growth will be much slower in China. But, and this is why I can't say, I, I can't be certain, um, you know, if, if the point here is if China didn't have any bottleneck, and the key bottleneck is the semiconductor industry, let's face it. If China didn't have that bottleneck, there may be others. It could still happen within a lower growth boundary. But let's not, let's not forget, our growth, uh, potential growth in the West will be very low, if not lower. So 1.9 may look very, very low, but the US might be lower. I, I mean, we need to take into account the impact of COVID-19 on all of us, not only, you know, China's aging and, and on top of that COVID-19. So this is why I think everybody, my point is everybody's coming down, China too, but how much more are we coming down? So that's kind of the, the, the question here. And the second is, if China doesn't have any bottleneck, then I think, you know, that vertical integration might actually do some good for China, even in an illiberal environment. And even, and this is something that, that uh, you, you didn't mention, I think it's very important, um, but you know it very well because we've discussed it many times, it's about the state control of the economy, which is, of course, harming China's potential growth even further. But remember, we're going in the same direction. We're intervening. We are, you know, basically uh, rescuing companies, zombie companies. That's, in a way, we're becoming more like China, if, if you allow me, which is not good for our own growth. China will not do very well. 
but at least it has a huge market, half of the apple. We might not have half of the apple, certainly not Europe. So that's that's why it's hard to answer that question. I hope I, however, gave some clarity to, to it. Thank you. Yeah, very striking figure, Alicia. So China growth uh, below 2% in the next decade will be a, a game changer for, for the world economy and probably for, for China, but for the world economy, for sure. Maybe the, my last question regarding China, uh, Alicia, will be on the, on the green transition because we have seen a lot of... Uh, I don't know, uh, my question will be, is it marketing or not, in fact, but we have seen that China is pledging, uh, wants to be at, uh, to have 25% of its autos uh, in 2025 uh, being electrical vehicles. And of late, uh, we have seen this a uh, bit of a surprising announcement by China uh, that, uh, that wants to be uh, uh, carbon neutral by 2000, uh, 2060. China is 28% uh, of world uh, CO2 emission, uh, Europe is 10%. Uh, but at the same time, uh, China is, is, is building uh, uh, coal plant like mad huh, because it's, it's coal is still 60% uh, of, uh, of uh, power production in China. And they have been uh, uh, building co new coal plant this year in 2020, but it was already the case last year, but this year, uh, like never before, huh, it's a record number of, uh, of opening of coal, which is the most uh, CO2 uh, uh, polluting uh, uh, power emission. So my question is quite simple, Alicia. Is it marketing, or do you think it's feasible for China to be, uh, to be neutral carbon in 20, 2060? Because if, it's, if, it's, if, if it is the case, sorry, that will be meaning massive investment, and infrastructure will be key for that, uh, in, into this uh, green transition. Is it, is it plausible? Is it feasible, Alicia? My short and simple answer would be, yes, it is marketing, but that's too easy. That's too easy, so I'm going to dwell on it a little bit. And uh, you said two things that are important. One is the, you know, electrical cars and whatever China does well, this could be solar panels, things that China, for which China very simply could already be for solar panels for sure in overcapacity. So if you are the market leader in a certain industry, whether green, brown, or blue, if you allow me, you're going to push for it. So that, that's, I wouldn't call it marketing, I would call it, you know, business sense, yeah? So that's one part of the story. China is becoming a leader in green industries, thus China is pushing for that. That's partially, you know, a, a marketing for it with, with a sense, you know, which, which, which means that China will, and this is your target, the 2060, or China's target, by the way, at the UN, United Nations, the 2060 to me means doesn't mean much unless you give me some, you know, uh, immediate targets. Uh, it, this could happen very soon, and then we will know whether this is marketing or real. I'm talking about now the actual uh, carbon-free or, you know, um, carbon-neutral um, objective, not so much the industries, which I do believe firmly, because that's in China's interest. The carbon-neutral, which is totally different, we'll see that at the during the discussions of the five-year plan in, in, in late October. So there's not much time to wait, actually, because we will need to see immediate targets, as you said, for this to actually happen. Now, why we may see some of them? <laughs> Promise. Because China needs to go on on infra, needs to continue with its stimulus. So, so that infra-led, green-oriented, digital 5G are, are the best infra projects China can actually undergo because it will become a leader in that industry, which, by the way, is not necessarily great news for Europe. It might be great news for the environment, but it might not be great news for Europe because we are trying to be leaders in those industries. And we might not be able to invest what China will be investing. So we need to think of it you know, from a commercial perspective, if, I, if you allow me. And, and, and then see whether those targets really exist. So I believe in the, not sure I believe in the full, you know, carbon free or uh, uh, carbon neutral uh, objectives in 2060. And to end, this objective comes at a very interesting time for Europe. Xi Jinping's speech is actually uh, speaking to us Europeans and certainly the commission negotiating a comprehensive, comprehensive, comprehensive agreement on investment with China at the current juncture, actually last weekend. Why? Because there's two things that the, the EU has asked very clearly. One is 
green deal. We need a green deal for you. Xi Jinping tells them 2060. I'll give you some more details. Second, SOE reform. And we know that Liu He has actually already started this, this SOE reform and has told us that he will do great. We've been waiting for a while, to be frank. Will that convince the Europeans to go ahead with the deal with China? Let's see. But my point is, it's easy to promise 2060 and get a deal in 2020, isn't it? Marketing, maybe I would call it strate strategic thinking, frankly speaking, because Xi Jinping is killing too many birds with one single shot, 2060, carbon neutral for China. So not bad, frankly speaking. Thank well, you. That's probably good news for planet anyway. So thank you very much, Alicia. I suggest we, we move, uh, move west from here uh, to, to Troy and uh, uh, we've seen that the latest polls are, are, are showing a nice lead for Joe Biden. Uh, to, to this, this morning, it was a 16-point uh, lead for Joe Biden. So maybe my first question uh, is you want to ask, and uh, a, a bit tricky to, to answer, but uh, for you, Troy, uh, uh, is it a done deal for Joe Biden, uh, the, this uh, presidential election, you think? Okay, hi, everyone. It's great to be with you. Hope you're all doing well. So the polls are pretty clear at this moment. Joe Biden uh, is in a firm and resounding lead. Now, the first thing everyone is going to say, so I'm going to stop you guys here, is that, yes, were the polls wrong in 2016? What I would say is, well, they were like half right, actually. In the two weeks leading up to the 2016 election, polls on average had Hillary Clinton up by roughly four percentage points. She ended up winning by roughly 3 million votes, which was good for uh, more than 2%. So the polls had 4%. She won by a little more than 2%. Not perfect, but mostly there. Okay. Where these polls were epically wrong was at the state level. Pacific states were battleground states in the middle of the country. Those are the regions where you can't be wrong. Now, those were areas in which Trump won by a very slim margin. He won three states by a combined 80,000 per person. If it's rain election day, that could go the other way. If we look to 2020, even in battleground states, Biden has a resounding lead, even more so than Hillary Clinton did. So Trump has a lot of ground to make up. Betting markets following the debate, and even when, when Trump came down with coronavirus, they were pretty unambiguously clear. Uh, Biden is in the lead, but it, no, it is not a done deal. Thank you, Troy. Thank you, Troy. Maybe a question to follow up on what, uh, when, uh, what Alicia was, uh, was mentioning with, with China, um, maybe to use the link between China and, and, and the US. Um, do you think that in a case, and uh, we are going to publish, uh, we just published a, a comprehensive paper on, on the what could happen if, uh, if uh, Joe Biden wins, uh, and, and including with the Congress. So my question for you, Troy, do you think with China that uh, uh, Biden being the new president that will change the relationship between China and the US, will it be a, a game changer and a bit of a, a calming down this uh, cold war that we, 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 the proxy of a cold war at least, that we, we, we start to see with China and the US? I think it's very difficult to say that it won't change. I think it almost definitely will change. But the question I don't think is whether it will change or not. I think it's whether the relationship improves or gets worse. With Trump, we know what's going to happen in the event that he's reelected. There will be more national security tariffs. Uh, there will be more regulation, more sanctions on Chinese individuals and firms. That much is resoundingly clear. Now, the question is, is what happens with, with Biden? What does he do that's going to be different? First, he said, point blank, very clearly, he will be removing the national security tariffs. So then the question becomes is, what will fill this place? In that case, it's going to be Congress. And this is one of the most bipartisan, uh, unanimous things in the U.S. Uh, political realm at this moment. There is a desire not only uh, on behalf of the Washington establishment, but also amongst uh, the greater populace in general, to in some ways punish, reproach, or check China's rise. So in the event that Congress does pick up the slack, you're going to have much more modest, careful tariffs, 
And I'll even venture to say that they are going to be much more suspect. This is going to be a key area in which special interests in good old-fashioned uh, American-style corruption leaks into the foreign policy realm. So interesting, Troy. And um, in, general, in broader terms, so uh, that was uh, what Joe Biden could be doing with, with China. What, what are Bidenomics, in a way? What, what is the characteristic of uh, Joe Biden being elected? Once again, if we take the, uh, the assumption that he, he gets the Congress, because he, he, if, he, if he don't get the Congress, probably the, uh, the, politics, the, the, the politics that Biden can, can implement will be much more limited. Let's assume that he gets the Congress. What will be Bidenomics uh, by then? That's a fantastic question. So Joe Biden throughout his campaign, like all politicians when they're running for office, they say conflicting things, sometimes in a single sentence, which is really impressive when you think about it. But throughout his campaign, there have been a few themes and priorities which have really come into focus. The first is he and his party have been very aggressive in advocating for a $15 an hour federal minimum wage. I don't think he's going to get 15, even if he has congressional control, for the simple reason that the existing federal minimum wage is at $7.25 an hour. They're going to need more than a doubling of the federal minimum wage to get to 15. Now, having said that, I think what is certainly possible is 10, 11, or $12 an hour if they're really aggressive, and that will be phased in over a multi-year period, probably over the entire duration of his four-year presidency, or you know, if he runs. I don't think he's going to run, but beside the point. Additionally, there is a green energy bend to a lot of what he has advocated for. He seeks to ban drilling on public lands, namely the Gulf of Mexico and Alaska, which it disproportionately affects. But he's also at some point said he wants to ban fracking, hydraulic fracking. For those of you that may or may not be, you know, uh, have an understanding of this, this has been the determining factor in the U.S. over the last 20 years which has allowed the country to move from a net importer of energy products to a net exporter of ones. And obviously, with that transition has come a massive geopolitical win. We no longer have to rely upon the Middle East for oil. We still do in some cases, but for the most part, we don't have to. Okay. Additionally, uh, he has sought uh, time and time again to make the tax code more progressive, meaning the more money you make per year, the more taxes you're going to make. Now, he also seeks to tax what is known as the non-working rich. He wants to do that without a wealth tax, and his main proposition is that he wants to raise the capital gains tax so that it is in line with, with basic income taxes. Again, I think this will be tough to do, but who knows? I think, I think it's possible, but I think it's tough. So, thank you, Troy. And same question for Trump. Uh, probably, if, uh, well, according to the latest poll, but like you said uh, uh, in your introduction, Troy, uh, uh, never relied too much on, on polls in this, in this context. But uh, probably, if Trump wins, it will be without the Congress or without the, uh, the, the lower chamber, uh, the House of, uh, of Representatives. So, if Trump wins and pretty much having the same uh, uh, room of maneuver, what will be Trump 2.0? What will be Trump doing differently? <laughs> That's a great question. So usually what happens when presidents are reelected to a second term, they tend to be a little bit more aggressive. You know, they campaign, they get their first term, they tend to move closer to the center as they try and draw consensus and be a little bit more agreeable as they seek a second term. Now, in the second term, what they tend to do is they tend to be a little bit more aggressive in trying to get what they want. Now, if Trump doesn't have Congress, it's going to be very difficult for him to get the tax cuts he wants, uh, have any sort of the foreign policy uh, aims that he, he, you know, he seeks to achieve. What is resoundingly clear is that he will be more authoritative using national security tariffs, national security measure, measures to in some ways guide economic policy. Now, what's funny about this is that Trump in many ways has opened you know, the genies out of the bottle. Politicians for Time to come, they will be using their national security authority to infect uh, economic policy. I think that's the lesson to take from Trump. He will be more aggressive, especially when it comes to China. And specifically, what I'm really kind of surprised on that he hasn't uh, done, which makes me think he's saving it for his second term, is that he might even use quotas on Chinese imports, 
And that would be infinitely more disruptive for financial markets. I think that's the chief risk of a, of a second Trump uh, term. Um, yes. Thank you, Trump. So, thank you, Troy. So, maybe a question for, for Alicia to do the transition <laughs> is to uh, uh, to see um, on the China's point of view, what would be best? Is it Biden or is it Trump for, for China? Because in a way, uh, Trump has been done of uh, tariff war and so on and so forth, but on the other way around, he's doing a lot of uh, uh, retractation, isolationism of, 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 of the U.S. In, on the other way around, and this is quite favorable to China, which is more able to uh, uh, to, to play uh, to, to play uh, more expensive on, 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 on this regard. So for you, Alicia, and we have two minutes left. Uh, short answer: uh, What is best, Trump or Biden for China? Best would be that any of the two win without a clear majority because that will weaken the U.S. That's very clear. Um, and, you know, if there is a period of, of uh, uh, confusion as to what's happening in the U.S. or riots, even better. That, that, in my opinion, is the best. I actually think Biden might be more dangerous for China in as far as Biden could opt to use multilateral uh, multilateralism, and most importantly, alliances, including, of course, the transatlantic alliance, but even Japan, to basically come towards China in a un with a united front. And I use that because that's the you know Chinese way, in a way, to th that would be the reaction to China's united front. So, so it is very important to realize that Biden might actually come with others, as opposed to Trump. And, and also the fact that Trump is isolating the U.S., I think, makes Biden more of a, you know, of a structural danger for China. Um, uh, I don't think Biden will be ready to kind of renegotiate, start with scratch, no trade war, no phase one deal, because that would not, that's not really what he's campaigning for. So my, I think it will be more elegant, but perhaps more harmful for China than if Trump were to win, especially if Trump is kind of uh, aware that that this is really a second term and no more. And, you know, he, he has to kind of pack and, and go and starts packing very soon. That would be much easier for China. And certainly if he doesn't control Congress, that would be you know, a piece of cake. I'll, I'll, I'll leave it there. Well, answer of all, lots of these questions will be on the 3rd of November. Probably most likely a few days after that. Uh, remember that in 2000, between Al Gore and Bush, it, takes, it took uh, one month to get the results. Let's hope it's not going to be the case, but clearly uh, we might see a little bit of delay with the, uh, the mail votes uh, in the US. So probably lots of answers early November, let's say. Thank you very much. We're right on time. Thank you for this very interesting panel. We will now move on to the question and dear public, I invite you to check out the uh, uh, interactive uh, discussion box on the right hand side of your screen if you'd like to also ask some questions. We have eight minutes for that. So let me ask the first question to our, our panelists. If China is contracting in his own market, is the new Silk Road project still makes sense? I guess it's for you, Alicia. Thank you. I'll be very fast. Uh, it's a very good question because we're in an infra forum. So, you know, uh, Berkland Road is, of course, about infra. And uh, many, many people wonder, is China retrenching from its, its infra investments? Uh, yeah, the, the short answer is not if they're strategic. So China is still pushing for, the, for example, the China-Pakistan economic corridor is very important for China to get access to the Wadar port to Iran's gas, they won't stop that anytime soon. But if, if, if it's an, something non-essential, especially on the real estate, so the new capital of Egypt, say, I think that risks much more than an, a major infrastructure project. So if, if anything has to be remained, that will be the cross-border infrastructure projects that China has been building for a while, including, of course, gas pipelines. And as I said, the China, Pakistan economic corridor. China might, however, not engage in new projects, massive projects, because the, the financial resources need to remain at home to, to protect China from a major recession. So that, so no major new projects, in my opinion, but certainly keeping those that are now in place and, and still uh, working on them. Sure. 
Another question, are you expecting China's company to continue to invest in infra companies in Europe as they have done through uh, state-owned enterprises? Yes, very good question. So, uh, um, first of all, there's two ways in which China comes to Europe on the infra space. The most obvious one is buying companies. So this is M&A. M&A has actually come down quite aggressively, China's M&A into the world, but very importantly, not as much in Europe. So in relative terms, Europe is by far the largest recipient of China's investment uh, purchases of companies. And that is especially true. This is good news for the infra space for actually robotics uh, and semiconductors, not as much um, uh, infra. But the other way, though, is project finance. And I think that's going to continue because these companies are basically in overcapacity, so they need to go somewhere. And remember that there will be a lot of funds, you know, in Europe and, and projects in Europe as well. So we may still see them here. So I, I think I wouldn't just discount them going back home and just retrenching fully. The world is big, and, and if there are projects to participate in and have the financing, why not? So, yes, competition from China will remain. Another question, how much U.S. candidates are promising on infra stimulus? Who is the best advocate of infra? Maybe Troy? Yes, hi guys. That is a fantastic question. Infrastructure spending is an issue that each party has advocated for at some point over certainly the last 10 years. What almost inevitably happens is one party gets in power, the other one blocks them. And infrastructure spending, especially from the federal level, is a very pork barrel project. Uh, and so as a result, uh, people are kind of reticent to, to, to go too deep into it. Now, to answer the question more directly, who is the best? It's almost certainly the Democrats. They have been infinitely more willing to open up the government's purse strings and spend. And especially in an economy that is deeply depressed uh, at this point. This is one of the most impactful uh, policies the government can take. It is highly, uh, it is a high multiplier. You have a situation where interest rates are near all time lows. You have a situation where you have plenty of workers and there is a bevy of evidence to show that projects like this in today's circumstances can very likely pay for themselves. And that's a free lunch, and I, I think that's a great idea. Um, but I think that I think it almost definitely will come from the Democrats and not the Republicans. I have a last question. What is the U.S. candidate's position on Brexit? Actually, we didn't mention that. Troy? That's a good question. Yes. So in terms of Brexit, it, it, it's kind of unclear. Uh, I think the U.S. mostly will try and stay out of that. Uh, I think the lesson we can take from Trump and Trumpism is that developed countries are going to be turning inward a lot more. Uh, they're likely going to stay out of the Brexit uh, considerations, but populism is definitely here to stay in the U.S. These will, you know, the, the Bernie Sanders of the world, Donald Trump, the Alexandria ocasio Cortezes, they will be recurring characters in the U.S. political novel. Uh, they will not be one-off characters. They might have different names, but they will be alike politically. Um, so Brexit type dynamics, uh, those certainly could continue uh, for the foreseeable future following a Biden presidency, which will be a short term four year return to kind of normalcy. Well, thank you very much to all three of you. And we'll now move on to our next session in about uh, 12 minutes, uh, in about 15 minutes, less than 15 minutes. And our next panel will be on COVID-19 and NACID test for infra debt investor. We will be live from New York. Thanks you again. Thanks to all the panelists. And if you have any questions, do not hesitate to contact our moderator for the next following session. We will also have the possibility to ask questions. So please get ready. It will be in about 14 minutes. See you there. Thank you.
Thank you.